Hi everyone and welcome to another video. This video is the first in a series that I decided to do around this classic Apple Mac Pro 1.1. I actually bought this Mac without really wanting to. I'll come back to that later, but I decided to at least make the best of it and have some fun while seeing what we can still do with this machine today. In this video, I plan to give a short introduction to this Mac Pro 1.1 and then I'll install an SSD and get this machine to run its latest possible version of macOS, which is El Capitan. Despite this being a Mac, running this older version of macOS might not be the best operating system for this device. That's why I will do a follow-up video where I will also install Windows 11 on this machine and I also plan to upgrade the CPUs. So make sure to subscribe in order to not miss all of that. Let me go back first and tell you a bit more about how I got this machine to begin with. As I mentioned, I didn't plan on buying a Mac Pro 1.1. Instead, some time ago, I wanted to get my hands on another 4.1 or 5.1 mainly to try to install Ventura and also because I missed playing around with one of these. Unfortunately, a 4.1 or 5.1 still goes for a pretty high price, so I was just keeping an eye on secondhand websites for some time, hoping to find an interesting deal. One day, I saw an advertisement described as Mac Pro, dual 2.66 GHz Xeon CPUs and a GT120 video card. There was nothing mentioned about the model or year, nor any screenshots. The price was on the low side, but not suspiciously low. The advertisement also had a few photos, and on these there was a Mac Pro with two Firewire 800 ports. That's important, as that's about the only thing you can use on the exterior to distinguish between a 1.1 to 3.1 and a 4.1 or 5.1. Together with the GT120, which is the default video card in a 4.1, I was pretty convinced this was exactly what I was looking for. So I agree with the seller, I went to pick up the machine, but there was no possibility to test as the seller told me he didn't have a monitor anymore since he bought a MacBook to replace this Mac Pro. His explanation made sense and I was in a hurry, so I paid and took the Mac with me. Never even looked properly at the machine as I didn't have any reason to suspect anything. You probably see it coming already. And indeed, it turned out that this was not a 4.1, but the 1.1 that I have here instead. Guess that will learn me to rush things and make assumptions without double checking. But hey, here we are now. Damage taken, so let's make the best of things and see what this device is still worth. Let's have a closer look at this hardware, as this is what makes this machine so special. There still is a large group of enthusiasts which love what Apple did with this in terms of design and ease of upgrade. I do consider myself as one of these as well. What we have here is the first generation Intel x86 based Mac Pro that Apple released. It is the successor of the Power Mac G5, which had a similar looking and to my ID timeless design. It was released back in 2006 and was the start of a series of modular and powerful Xeon based workstations which were a big success in the market. The 1.1 came in three versions, each with dual Intel Xeon CPUs with different clock speeds. This is the middle spec model, which has two 2.66 GHz Intel Xeon 5150 CPUs. As you can see, originally the machine also came with 1 GB of DDR2 ECC RAM. The memory is installed on some kind of expansion card on the motherboard. Each of these two cards can host up to four DDR2 ECC DIMMs. The maximum of total memory you can install is 64 GB, which means you would need to install 8 times 8 GB. In my machine, there currently is 4 times 4 GB, so 16 GB in total. In terms of storage, this case can house up to 4 SATA drives in these easy to remove drive bays. I bought it with already 3 drives installed, 2 times 250 gig and 1 hard disk of 500 gigabyte. The first drive looks like the original 250 gigabyte drive, seeing the Apple logo and date code. Nice to see that this one is still doing fine. On top here, there is also room for two optical drives. In this model, they are still connected with IDE, and mine still has the original super drive as Apple calls it. For the video card, there is indeed an NVIDIA GT120 in my machine. 
This must have been replaced later, as this version doesn't even show a boot screen due to the lack of 32-bit EFI support. Originally, the machine came with a GeForce 7300 GT with 256 MB as video card. I did manage to get my hands on one of these, but the only reason you would want one is to be able to see the boot screen as it doesn't perform really super. Further, the machine also has four PCIe 1.0 slots from which the X16 slot on the bottom is used for the video card. The firmware of this 1.1 can be upgraded to a 2.1 and that's also what has been done in the past to this machine as we can see here in About This Mac. And while we are here and already have a good idea of the hardware, let's take a look at software. Unfortunately, that's where you will probably be a bit less enthusiastic. The latest officially Apple supported version for this machine is 10.7 or Lion, which got released back in 2011. With the release of Mountain Lion in 2012, Apple dropped support for the 1.1. That is only six years after the release of this hardware, which is a shame, especially seeing how performance this machine still was at that time. The main reason for this decision has to do with the 30-bit EFI ROM used here. Despite the rest of the hardware being fully 64-bit, Apple still decided to drop support. This will also cause us some extra trouble in order to get Windows 11 running on this hardware and in order to get a boot screen when upgrading the video card. Nevertheless, as is usually the case with these kind of things, some enthusiasts managed their way around the 32-bit EFI limitation by using a rewritten bootloader that will enable you to run macOS versions up to El Capitan. Unfortunately, that is where it stops, as newer macOS versions, like Sierra, required support for SSE 4, which is lacking on the hardware. At this moment, this Mac program, comma 1, still is running on the last official supported version, Line. Things seem to work just fine. It looks like the previous owner did perform a fresh install on that original 250GB hard drive. Everything feels really smooth and fluent, and it looks nice to see this old version of macOS back after all this time. So, we plan to use El Capitan. Unfortunately, the originally supplied GPU is not sufficient, but the GT120 with 502MB, which is in here, should do just fine. Before all of this, let me also install an SSD, which will greatly improve performance in any case. I'll put a 2.5 inch SSD in an enclosure, which makes it exactly the size of a 3.5 inch drive. As the connectors are lined up the same, we can use that second free drive bay to install the SSD. It's pretty straightforward to install the SSD in the enclosure. We can just slide it in the connector and then fix it to the bottom with the four supplied screws. Then all it takes more is to fix the enclosure to a free drive bay bracket. And to get that back in the case. After booting into macOS Lion once more, the SSD got detected, but needs to be initialized. In disk utility, we can indeed see that new drive, which is in bay 2, and to start using it, we can just erase it and give it a name. From here, the steps I took to get El Capitan installed on the SSD are based on another YouTuber's video. I'll put a card here to that video and also a link in the description. I will not go into too much detail as you can find all what you need in that other video. As a start, I pre-downloaded the required images on the currently installed OS in the folder El Capitan that I have on the desktop here. As the first step, we need to open that disk image by dragging it to Disk Utility and then scan the image for restore. Once the scanning is complete, we can use this disk image as a source for our restore. As destination, as you could guess, I will pick the newly installed SSD and click on Restore.
This will copy the contents of that disk image to the actual SSD. Now that that image got restored, we can close disk utility. And the next step is to replace the bootloader with a modified version that allows booting El Capitan on this Mac that has 32-bit EFI. Before we can do that, we need to allow changes to the boot EFI file. To do so, we need to open Finder and navigate to System, Library, Core Services, and here we can find boot.efi on the SSD. Now open Terminal and type the following. Following by dragging the boot.efi file to use it as an argument to the command. We also need to enable Finder to show hidden files with the following command in the terminal window. Followed by a restart of Finder by killing it. Now we're ready to override the boot.efi file with a modified version downloaded from Piker's website. Still in system library core services, Replace the original boot.efi with the modified version and confirm. We need to do this a second time, but now in USR, standalone, i386. And here again, we need to replace boot.efi with the downloaded and modified version. Right now, we can boot the system using the SSD. Since the installed video card doesn't allow us to see the boot screen, we can use Startup Disk Utility to select which drive to boot from. With a card that does display the boot screen, you can just hold Alt or Option during boot to show the boot menu. So, in Startup Disk, we select to boot from the disk containing 10.11, which is El Capitan, on the SSD, and click Restart. Later, from El Capitan, we could use the exact same method to boot back into Lion if we desire. Okay, it looks like the system booted as expected and we can see the initial setup dialog for El Capitan. After quickly going through these steps, we get to see the El Capitan desktop wallpaper. About this Mac confirms us that this is indeed the case and it looks like all the hardware is recognized as well. Now that we have El Capitan on here, the question comes on how usable a Mac Pro 1.1 still is for today's typical tasks. The hardware is not the newest, but as you can see with starting these basic applications, it doesn't really give a sluggish impression. If you don't look at power consumption, it's still pretty usable. The real problem is probably the age of the operating system. For example, I wanted to see if I could play a YouTube video, but the version of Safari on here doesn't even display YouTube. Then I continue to install Google Chrome, but here as well you can see that it doesn't longer allow us to run the newest version. Especially for tools that bring you on the internet, this is a problem. I had a look at a few other common tools and the same applies for most of these as well. For example, Audacity requires 10.13 or High Sierra. DaVinci Resolve needs 10.14.6 or Mojave. And even Firefox, which tends to support older versions for a longer time, requires at least macOS 10.12 or newer. But also smaller apps, even things like Spotify, won't work as it requires OS 6 10.13 or above. You could use older versions of these applications, but I guess it's clear that this will severely limit you and even expose some security risks if you want to go online with this macOS version and older browsers or tools. Eventually, I did manage to play that YouTube video in Chrome to test it. And it does work pretty fluent in Full HD. The downside is the amount of resources that are used for this, as you can see here in Activity Monitor. 
I'm curious to see how that CPU upgrade that I have planned will improve that. That's all I had for this video. In the next part, I'll be looking into how to install Windows 11 on this machine. Not only because I just like to get Windows 11 to work on unsupported hardware, but because this allows you to run a non-outdated operating system version, which allows you to run the latest and secure software as well. Pretty excited to see how well this 15-year-old hardware will handle this. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you have enjoyed this video and if you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you have suggestions for videos or remarks on this one, always welcome in the comments and don't forget to subscribe if you like these kind of videos. Thanks again and hope to see you back here soon.